to a lesson about investigations. And the reason we thought this was important was for you to understand the investigative process from the Department of Corrections perspective. So somewhere in this, you're going to be involved because that forensic exam would start after an investigation being launched because an aggravated sexual assault would have occurred. And then in doing in-person advocacy in the prisons, you will be dealing with a lot of talk about the investigation, perhaps, that's going on at the same time. So we're teaching you this lesson in order to best be able to complete your work. Um, it's important that you understand what the investigator will be doing. So we wanted to give you some perspective about what they're going to be doing. So we'll start with what are investigative principles? Like what are the things that we train investigators to believe in and that they have to be good at in order to provide a good investigation? And so one of those things is confidentiality. And I know it's really important to you, certainly really important to me, and in this environment, really, really important, um, extra important, if you will. So confidentiality, we want to make sure that we're not sharing information about what's going on. Because like I said earlier, that information can really spread like wildfire inside an institution. We want to make sure that we're professional and that we're treating the subject matter with the dignity and respect that it deserves. So really using that emotional intelligence to tap into what is the experience that this person just went through and am I treating it with that level of professionalism. In the comments that we make around Priya, in the way that we show up on time, in our professional attire, in all the ways that professionalism is determined. We want to make sure that the investigators that work for the Department of Corrections are competent, uh, that they are proficient in writing an investigative report, that they also know good techniques for, for interview. And so they're well trained and really know how to complete a thorough report. We want to make sure that we're always focused on safety. I can't tell you how many times I've probably said that today. Um, and well, you probably can if you've been counting. But really focus on safety more than in most other settings, that we are thinking about not getting the perfect interview, but that safety comes first and that your safety comes first and that the safety of the investigator comes first. We want to make sure that the investigator is impartial. And so the rule of thumb for me in training investigators has always been if you can walk into an investigation and have some kind of bias on either side, if you can say that person would or wouldn't do this or I've had enough experiences with that person, you should recuse yourself from that case. That I'm saying I have some kind of dog in the fight, for lack of a better <laughs> analogy, but saying, huh, I'm too close to this. I don't believe that my partner could have done this, and so am I impartial? Am I walking in? Do I have a bias towards this particular crime type? Maybe I know the crime of the offender that I'm dealing with, and I just can't possibly imagine that they would have been involved in sexual violence as um, the victim. So uh, am I objective in very much the same way, that the, the objectivity and impartiality kind of fit together, that can I look at the subject with clear eyes based on only the information ahead of, in front of me and not on past experiences with this particular individual and not with any bias. I want to make sure that my investigations are timely and thorough. And so the two really go together, that I'm making sure that somebody isn't sitting, not being able to discuss what has occurred um, because, one, we know that information goes away. Right? So if I've been through a traumatic incident, maybe I only hold on to that information for a certain amount of time before I dissociate. Maybe the other witnesses in the case are going to forget their version of events because we do know that memory is linked in a lot of cases to trauma. So if something traumatic happens to me today, I'm going to remember more of today potentially or not remember today more than the people for whom this is a Monday or a Tuesday and nothing significant occurred. So think about if I asked you um, on one of my favorite podcasts, the very first question, and uh, if you have well, I'm not going to plug them. Anyway, so, but it, it, the question was if somebody asked you about what you were doing for breakfast, let's say, six weeks ago, would you remember? And if the day was insignificant in every other way, you wouldn't. Um, and so that's been pretty clearly linked that if something traumatic happened that day, you probably would. So we also look for identification of systemic issues to prevent and then address retaliation. So again, back to the systems issues and 
how our processes work. So is there something, is there a breakdown in the process that the agency is using um, that is causing uh, the ability to retaliate against offenders um, who have reported? And so then really looking at what's your role in the investigative process? And so want to talk about if you were to attend an interview, um, that we don't want to answer, answer questions for people, and some of this probably is common knowledge for you all, but just a good reminder that in a lot of situations that jeopardizes the entire investigation, that the, the alleged victim is not answering their own questions. And so really important to us that we get good, clean information that wouldn't be under the scrutiny of the court if it were to proceed to that level. So we then go into investigative steps. So what that process looks like is the initial report comes in. I say there's been a sexual assault. Now, if that's an aggravated sexual assault and I'm in that 120-hour window, I'm going to be transported to the hospital, in which case we would ask that you come, you'd, you'd stay with me for that exam, and then the investigator is going to step in at that point and start their investigation at the same time. So they're, they're in, the interaction with them wouldn't happen here. They're going to do a preliminary fact finding. They're going to locate evidence. They're really looking for the kind of the high level, who, what, when, where, why, and then starting to plan the investigation. So who are the people they're going to need to talk to, um, starting to prepare for interviews, researching, re reviewing the evidence that they have gotten. So whether that's video, that they need to watch a week's worth of video. Sometimes uh, we've experienced cases where folks say, you know, it happened. 20 years ago, and the statute for PREA is pretty well broad. So we're saying we would look into that case still. So reviewing all of that evidence. Then we go in as an investigator and interview and re-interview as needed. So as many times as that takes. We are careful and deliberate in PREA cases not to interview more than is absolutely necessary because we really don't want to re-traumatize people. So we're conscious of that, and we pay a lot of attention to how thorough are we going in. So am I well prepared for this interview so that I'm not going to need to go back a bunch of times? We're going to then analyze and review the information and evidence. We're looking for gaps. Is there something that can't be explained in the information that I have gathered? So is there, most things in life have some form of logic or some form of pattern, and the stories that I tell you should make some kind of sense. And if there is something that's illogical in the middle of the story, an investigator should be going back and asking more questions about that. So they're going to write the report. And within the Department of Corrections, each facility is going to have a different way of reviewing that. But often there are multiple reviewers at multiple levels going to the highest ranking people in the institution who are going to be reviewing these investigations. Um, and that really is the amount of seriousness that we are placing on this. They review the report in order to ensure it's complete, that it's thorough, that no more questions need to be answered. And then once the findings are made, we're going to analyze as a bigger group. So one of the PREA standards talks about that there be a PREA response team that gets together and they're going to, it's not the response team, sorry, it's the review team that's going to get together and they're going to review for systemic and supplemental issues. So they're really looking for what are the things that we can change? Can we put a lock on the door? Can we not put a lock on the door? Are there line of sight issues in the building that I'm in? And how do I um, resolve those issues so that we don't have this type of case in the future? So when do we do a law enforcement referral? So the policy says that all allegations that appear to be criminal in nature will be referred for law enforcement investigation by the appointing authority. So that in your DOC prison facilities is going to be your superintendent or superintendent designee if they're out, and in a work release would be the community corrections supervisor or the field administrator. So the RCWs for both custodial sexual misconduct first and second degree are going to be used here. And we'll go, I'm going to talk about what those are because I think it's really important that in this context we really understand what the legal driver is for why we're doing this work. So does it meet the RCW? Um, but we would do the law enforcement referral. So if I'm in 
I find information that says there has been an aggravated sexual assault, that law enforcement referral is being made right away before we're interviewing people. We're going to offer it to local law enforcement to do investigation. If they decline it, which they do, um, sometimes we would then proceed with the administrative investigation. But pretty important to remember that internal Dep Department of Corrections investigations are administrative and that it would become criminal once referred to law enforcement. So custodial sexual misconduct in the first degree, um, I gave you the RCW number so that you can look it up if you're really obsessed with reading the language, um, like I am, honestly. I really want to know what the driver is behind the work that I'm doing. So a person's guilty of this when they have sexual intercourse with another person. Um, when the victim is a resident of a state, county, city, juvenile facility, it's not limited to jail, prison, detention center, or work release. Um, and it's under correctional supervision. So here's that perception of power. And then we'll talk about the, the second item for this is that the perpetrator has to be an employee or contract personnel of a correctional facility. And in this context, volunteers and contract staff are also considered an employee um, that we are saying that your, the perception is that you have that power over the, the terms, conditions, length, or fact of incarceration. So could you relay information to somebody at the prison that says they've done this horrible thing to me and lengthen their sentence? And, and the fact is you could. Um, so if a victim reasonably has a reason to believe this, and often with correctional staff, just merely me having a badge will, hey, does that give you a reasonable belief that I have some power over your life? I think it does. So, and then when the victim's being, they have to be detained under arrest or in the custody of a law enforcement officer, and the perp is a law enforcement officer. So, I've said this a lot today, but consent of the victim is not a defense to a prosecution in this section, and this is a Class C felony. And so, the RCW for a second degree includes the same conditions, um, but is expanded to be sexual contact. So that really has some wide uh, language in it. So sexual contact could be rubbing up against somebody, that could be hugging somebody, and we have referred those types of behaviors in the past. Again, both of those definitions can be found on the Washington State Legislature RCW page if you want to do some more explanation, exploration about what that looks like. So some of the rights that might be used in a pre-investigation, I wanted to give you this information because if you are involved in an interview or um, have been involved in an interview in the past in some way, you might have seen some of these used. So Miranda is, if you've watched any amount of TV and any police show ever, you've heard Miranda given, it's the right to silence that's given to an accused person when they're in custody. So this is... you. The whole, you have the right to remain silent, anything that you say may, can and will be held against you in a court of law. So really important that they know uh, if they've received a Miranda warning. This is not typically used in a prison setting because they're already in custody. So they are in, in the second part of this de definition we talk about, in a custodial situation or any interview interrogation to let the detained person know. So somebody who's in a prison is already incarcerated, they're already in a custodial situation. So what we say as an agency is we would let them leave. So they have not gotten their Miranda warning. So if an offender were to say in the middle of a pre investigation, may I leave? Yes, they may. Um, so they're not falling under that custodial situation. Important that if you're present for a Miranda, an interview in which somebody's Mirandized, law enforcement is likely there, it's very unlikely that that's going to be a DOC staff member delivering that Miranda warning. Gary, the Gary rule comes from a case that had to do with traffic ticket fixing inside a police agency. And so what they had said was, we're compelling you as an employee of our agency to participate in an, investi an administrative investigative um, process and then use the same information to prosecute them. And that cannot happen. So under Garrity, we're compelling an employee 
to participate in the administrative investigative process, and they then understand that we can't refer that same information for criminal investigations. So should we refer the case, doesn't mean they can't be prosecuted, but should we refer the case, anything that's said in that interview in which that is compelled can't be used. Um, they, they could get the same information through their own interview. And then Weingarten writes, most of, so the largest population of correctional staff of one type are correctional officers. Uh, they make up a huge amount of our population of staff and they are union. And so Weingarten talk, speaks to, and there are a lot of staff who are not officers who are also union. Um, and so being part of the union gives you the right to union representation in any process that could re could reasonably result in corrective action. So if a staff member is asking for a union representation, they would use their wine garden rights and we would certainly respect that. So some of the qualities needed to conduct a successful investigative interview, we really need to be creative and resourceful. So we're gonna do a lot of work ahead of time, um, in order to accumulate and review evidence. We're gonna really dig in, maybe look at social media, review phone calls, talk to people who might have witnessed, so first responders, other people that were involved in the incident. Um, the investigator really needs, especially in PREA investigations, needs to believe that PREA is important and have some level of commitment to this process and this legislation to say, but I get it and I care about it and this is important that people really have the right not to be exposed to sexual violence during incarceration. They need to be impartial and objective. Um, if they come in with even the slightest bias, they're not gonna have a great outcome because you can read it. You can see when people think about the last report you wrote, if it was about a person, you can really read what you thought about them. Um, and it's almost subconscious that that ends up being translated onto paper, good, bad, or otherwise. Uh, we want an investigator to be a fact finder and to really look for the facts and not their opinions. We want them to be adaptable and willing to hear things that are uncomfortable, often unnatural to them. So some of the sexual behaviors that people who participate in might not be things that you have understood um, or ever will understand. Certainly as an investigator previously in my life, there are many things that I heard that seemed very unnatural to me, um, but willing to hear them, willing to report about them. Um, and a good investigator needs to be themselves. They need to stay on track. They need to be respectful of whoever they're interviewing. But really that being yourself piece is I can't act like I'm something that I'm not, right? So the way that I deliver curriculum is different than somebody who might be more by the book and, and wants to be just kind of stick to the script. And that's not me. So I'm being who I am, which makes it a little easier to relate to me. But we all come from a different place where we relay information in a very different way. If it seems unnatural, folks are going to be really uncomfortable around us. So we want to also talk, and this certainly is something that you can think about in your own interactions, but physical location. So some of the things that we ask investigators, and then advocates too, to take into consideration when planning physical location for interview. Is it a neutral environment or is it perceived to be a neutral environment? So if I'm a staff member in a prison and I'm interviewing you in my office, it's not a neutral environment, right? Like I have a position of power now because this is my turf and now we're on my turf. We want to think about safety issues for both you and the offender. So are you in an area that they can be seen by other offenders? Are you outing them by being in this area? Because I promise you, folks know who you are once you're in the facility. So really, are you adjacent to the day room, pulling them aside and giving them information? You want to be aware of areas that the offender can't go, so not asking them to go to an area that is out of bounds for them. Being aware for the potential of retaliation and then further victimization. So if they're telling on another offender for something that's occurred, could they uh, set themselves up for potential retaliation? And the answer would be yes. So we really want to think about that and be conscious of 
where are they going? And Kelly talked about it earlier with the call out that we were gonna keep it pretty vague so that folks don't know why they're going somewhere because yes, could that be used for potential retaliation in the future? Um, we wanna be aware of items that could be used as weapons and then know the nearest exit. And we talked about access and egress earlier, but often you'll be using an office or a room that somebody else uses for a different purpose. And so just going in, and for me, I usually sit down at a desk, look around, look for heavy objects that could be used as weapons. Maybe that's even a stapler or scissors or something else, and removing those from the top of the desk or at least between me and the offender. Um, or me and an angry person that's not an offender. Um, be aware of your own emotions or the investigator's own emotions and those of the offender. So really conscious of when we're escalating people, conscious of when we are being escalated or triggered by whatever we're talking about, and be willing to take those breaks. So often investigators will push to get the information and will push themselves past some comfortable emotional boundaries for them. Something else that's really important is establishing that baseline behavior early in an interview, especially in a situation of incarceration, because we're really looking for what do you normally act like? And then if that changes, should I be on high alert? That, wow, I, it appears that I've escalated you, so how am I gonna deal with that now so that I'm kind of ahead of things, um, so that people don't get out of control, so that I am keeping myself safe. So some of the complexity around investigating Priya is that the culture hasn't always been supportive of this type of investigation and certainly something that is evolving and people are really accepting and embracing that we care about prison raids and that we're curbing the numbers and that this makes folks safer. Um, but certainly there are institutions where people are less likely to talk because of fear of retaliation or other consequences that might occur. Certainly the code of silence is more distinct in some institutions. Um, really explaining to people that are involved in the pre process because they may have no experience with sexual assault. So that they understand that sexual assault is about power, not sex. I can tell you from having been on the stand in court several times with PREA cases that the question is always, well, they weren't sexually attracted to that inmate. And sometimes that has had, in my history, has had to do with the sexuality of the person who was the alleged perpetrator and me having to say this had nothing to do with sex. So really keeping that in mind, having those conversations about that, that's one of those areas that certainly you can help inform our work by saying this is what it's more about. Um, there is a potential for offender manipulation of the, offender, of the reporting system. So both the hotline that is used for external reporting and the internal reporting system um, that there have been cases that have proven um, to be deliberate manipulation of the system. So what that looks like generally is that I then say, so I don't like a staff member, I make a pre claim about them, and then if I'm saying it's false, what I'm really saying is we have evidence that they deliberately proceeded against a staff member. So we would hear them on the phone say, I'm gonna get that B word walked or whatever that looks like and not just that we're assuming that there's there's some manipulation of the system. So per the US Department of Justice, um, staff sexual misconduct is way more associated with female facilities. Um, it occurs throughout the system, and you heard earlier during the forensic exam slides that most of the responses for male offenders. That's the truth. The egregiousness of the cases in the men's facilities is often much worse. Um, and we have a lot of cases that happen in men's facilities. So this is not something that is always associated with female facilities. So I would argue that part of the reason that you hear more about it in female facilities is there's more social empathy, there's more, the attitude towards female offenders is more amicable. We have more empathy for them, especially as survivors that we say, you know, that poor girl, and that really would be the article, that this horrible man was so violent against this poor girl. And the opposite is true for male offenders where we would say that poor female staff member, she was so obviously manipulated and compromised by this horrible 
male offender. So really thinking about why it's presented that way um, is important for investigators and for advocates. So the standard of evidence for the Washington State Department of Corrections is preponderance of the evidence. So we use that in order to make decisions about all administrative investigations. That means that you're going to see one of the three following findings. So substantiated is that it's more likely than not to have occurred. So we're pretty sure it occurred. We're at 51% that it occurred. So there's something that tips it over that edge. Our unsubstantiated, it's unclear what occurred, but there is not 51% evidence that it did or did not occur. And then unfounded, it's more likely than not that it did occur, whatever the allegation is, and 51% that it did not occur. So what we're looking at with preponderance is higher level of evidence than probable cause. So in order to arrest somebody, I have to have probable cause. So that's my initial probable cause. Um, but it's not going to meet the criminal threshold of reasonable doubt, which is much higher than 51%. So I say that because you're going to have to take that into account if one of these cases moves forward for prosecution. There may be more work to do, um, and the investigation itself might not meet reasonable doubt. Although most of our cases do, we're pretty thorough in the way that we do investigations, so I would argue that most of them will meet reasonable doubt. There have been pretty few successful prosecutions involving PREA, and so very frustrating for me, certainly, and I'm sure for you that we see the sexual violence and then there, there aren't a ton of prosecutions coming from it. Um, some of the reasons that I can, certain, I can identify for that are that local jurisdictions are tapped. So there's not a lot of money, not a lot of resources to prosecute other crimes. And then you add these biases that society has about inmates, and maybe they don't care that this is occurring, or maybe they're just too busy and they're having a hard time prosecuting other crimes that we all take as, you know, egregious criminal behavior, murder, or a serious assault, or they're letting people go because they don't have enough bed space. And with the rise in population in incarceration nationwide, not hard to believe that that would occur. The standard of proof is higher. I talked about that, but like, okay, we might not meet reasonable doubts. So would we have to go back and look, or is there even enough there? We look at public perception that impacts the trial outcome. So one of the worst cases that I ever worked was uh, three male offenders that had been involved with a male staff member who was raping them and humiliating them deliberately and other reasons sexually. And the officer involved in the crime was a pretty small in stature man. And the three offenders were all down for murder. So their incarceration was due to pretty, so three aggravated murders uh, that were pretty large in size. And so when it was accepted for prosecution, they wanted to move ahead. And as any of you who have been involved in the trial know, Somebody sits down with you and kind of gets a feel for how you're going to do on the stand before you go into that trial. And when they sat down with the three offenders, they said, they're not going to do well on the stand, and we therefore are not going to prosecute. They felt that the community would not see them as folks who could have been victimized, and they, in fact, would have seen the staff member as more likely to be victimized or having been compromised. So you'll see some of that here and there. Hopefully you won't say a lot of it, because I'm hoping that the culture is changing in a positive way. Um, there's a perception offer of often that the offender caused the sexual relationship or that there was consent. And so in referring PREA cases to law enforcement in my career, I've heard things like, wow, good, good thing that guy got laid, or what did the officer look like, or are you sure they didn't want the sex? And, more specifically on the side with male offenders, but also with female offenders. And sometimes there's the, well, you know, they've, they've been in prison for 10 years. Why wouldn't they want to have sex? And then a lot of communities will cite evidentiary sufficiency, which is, is this in the best interest of the community that we prosecute? And often it's not because of money or other things. And, and again, there are many communities that lack the resources to, pro to prosecute these cases. And the thing that we know about our prisons is they're not generally in populous areas, and they're not generally in the most wealthy counties in the state. So it may be that your small county 
He doesn't have the money. So that really is investigations. We give you the information to really know what to look for when you're doing when you're participating in the investigative process. And please know that those reports are are reviewed at the highest level in order to ensure accuracy the whole way through. Thank you.